I think anyone above the age of 16 has had some type of run-in with heartbreak. This episode of Shogun manages to vividly show you heartbreak on screen in full detail. Hello, everyone. Terrence here with Hollywood I already did. If you haven't already, go ahead, like, share, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment, ring that bell below. Anytime we have something, you will be among the first to know. Episode 6 of Shogun is called Ladies of the Willow World, and uh, it's a good title for an episode that is pretty female-centric. For the most part, the guys have sort of sitting this one out. Um, you still have them there because they do their stories intertwine with whatever Mariko Lady Ochiba, and even to a lesser extent, Kiku, um, are sort of all doing. But this is basically their story. We see a young Mariko and a young Lady Ochiba and see that when they were younger, they were almost tied at the hip. Um, Mariko was brought to this, to um, Lady Ochiba's village, um, to live with Tornaga and all of those folks with her father um, before he does his due as an assassin. Um, and so there's this camaraderie that they sort of have that gets brought up, but you get to see how women, of no matter what, don't really get to make many of the decisions of their own. They may be betrothed, they may be alliance, they may be told that this is what they have to do with their body. They don't really have many options. And it's what they choose to do with that said uh, choice that sort of defines who they become in life and where we sort of see Mariko and Lady Ochiba split off in life. What we notice though is as um, we see them as, as kids, as they get older and they sort of define who they they are, um, I would argue that the eye of most of the men of the village was towards Mariko. She was also a skilled fighter. She seemed to be the one that everyone kind of was like, oh, that's the person I want. And um, it looked like Lady Ochiba didn't really receive that well. Um, she seemed to have sort of a, a, an envious eye of the way that people, she was, she took clock of everything. This, that's one thing that you can say about her is that she's a person who, who watches everything. She's watching people whispering. She's watching people do everything sort of in the background. She's seeing how everybody's reacting to Mariko and she don't like it. She ain't a fan of that at all. And so, um, her wheels probably sort of start turning to figure out how A, I can get her off the board, but two, what can I do to put myself in a higher ranking? Um, than her so that I can sort of, while everybody's gazing at her, I can sort of pull the wool behind the eyes and do some stuff in the background where I then have the upper hand. We see that Mariko and Ochiba are close when um, Mariko's betrothed to Buntaro. And what we learn here is that Buntaro is a part of a clan that nobody really respects. It's the poor clan. Anybody who's being aligned or trying to try to form an alliance with them is sort of a question as to why would that be the step? why would that be the way that you go like that's how bottom of the barrel we are he is um and she was trying to sell her on it like no you gotta do this you gotta do this for the alliance you gotta do this for the clan and whatnot and maria was like no, why he's irrelevant um this is ochiba's way of getting her off the board because hey if you go do something as beautiful as you are, if you are aligned with somebody who's considered to be a peasant, I no longer have to concern myself with you. You are nothing. You're, you have gone down levels. Whereas if I do anything else, I'm going to be above you no matter what, no matter how you look, no matter how many people want to be with you, you no longer have the value that I would have if I were to do something else. Um, in present day, Tornaga speaks to the remaining people who did not get sucked up or killed in the earthquake. Um, and it's the army has been that massive army that he came in with in a couple episodes ago before his son told him like, yeah, I made a bad mistake. It's cut, it's cut down quite a bit. Um, but in this, because of the continuous saving that Blackthorn keeps doing at, at him, I feel like Blackthorn needs to keep doing that because every time he does it, he gets gifts. Um, but he saves him again. He basically gives him, he gives him command of the entire guard, um, specifically the command of the fleet of the cannons. Like that's, that's all him. So he strips out of army, he gives that to, to, to Blackthorn. Um, and now he's his basically his number number one um, with running the army, which is not felt well by both Yabu and Ami, especially in their own village. Now neither of them, it's not even in the bloodline anymore, um, who's the second commander or the commander of this, this, this fleet. 
It actually bothers, truthfully, it actually bothers Ami more than it does Yabu. Yabu is kind of just like, that's the least of my concerns. We're going to die. <laughs> like, all hell is breaking loose. We can't get a message out to Ishido at all. Um, and this, we on the side where we don't have an army anymore. Half of our pe people are depleted. This is going to go terribly wrong. Who cares who's running this? We're going to die either way. In the previous episode, Mariko did mention to uh, Tornaga that Bentaro was, was, was slapping her around. And so this is the moment where Bentaro has to go to Toronaga and sort of apologize. And again, Toronaga honestly does not care about what he does as a husband to a wife. Like, I don't give a damn about that. Beat around, whatever. I don't care. Wink, wink, sort of. We get to the tail end of that later. Um, he can't let on that he cares about that. But what he does care about is like, hey, why, why did you feel the need to do that? And Buntaro sort of goes on to say that I thought after all this time that whatever cold as ice demeanor Mariko had from the jump of when we first got married, I thought that would have melted away by now. Just like seeing her talk and just having those conversations, I, I thought I would have that with her. I thought we could have worked ourselves into love from that point. Um, and he's like, but I was wrong. I'm a jealous man. But I've seen her break her ice down in regards to Blackthorn. And it gives Tornaga sort of a cause or pause. He sort of thinks about it. And he's like, wait, what are you talking about? But he doesn't really feed into it there. But when Taro says, it got me a little jealous. And Tornaga listens, he's heard, and he's taken sort of knowledge of that and but he says okay here's the deal you are going to have to isolate from her for seven days um isolate from her for seven days and it's basically in his brains he's trying to think of a way to sort of reset this um because he needs his he needs mariko to be with Buntaro. he also needs his commander to be set and not sort of um double dipping with his interpreter and his he he needs this all to be separate like, I need my commander on his best game. I need my interpreter on her best game. And I need the husband of the interpreter also be on his best game. None of you guys can be messing this up because I trust you guys. And I don't want anybody to sort of be able to be flipped or to not be on their best game because we're already losing people so quickly. Blackthorn shows up with Mariko because he's an interpreter and he still wants to leave Japan. Um, he's, despite the generosity and the rank, it keeps getting poured on to things and things and things. He's like, I don't want any of this. Um, to which Mr. and I was like, well, what can I give him that will please him? What will make him happy? And he informs him again. He's like, I've said it before. I want my ship. Just give me my ship back. Um, and when you give me my ship back, maybe I can have a little bit more onus on what I do. I'd like to, we should go attack the Portuguese. Like, that's what we should do. We should go get the black ship. We should attack it, take it down. You should not trust them. Um, he's not wrong in this. He shouldn't trust them. <laughs> but we'll get to that in a bit. But he's telling me, like, you should not trust them. Um, and I think we should go attack. In this verbal back and forth while he's while Mariko is breaking this down for Tornaga, she's sort of showing some um, hostility, concern, emotional dissonance with Blackthorn in this. Um, and so she's not translating everything, but you can see that there is a enough of a relationship between the two of them that what she's saying doesn't quite jive and that she's put some emotional weight behind what she has to translate for for Blackthorn. And Tornaga's like, okay, maybe Montaro is correct. Like she's, this isn't just an interpreter anymore. She is putting a little bit of extra on this and I need to nip this, I need to nip this mess in the bud. Blackthorn leaves and that's when Tornaga's like, I'm not giving him, I'm not giving him any of the things that he asked for. That's not happening. However, uh, what the hell is going on with you and Blackthorn? Like, he sees it. He's like, something is wrong. What is happening? He's like, there's nothing to worry about. There's nothing to concern yourself with. He's like, okay, cool. To make sure that you know your place, he knows his place, and that whatever the hell is happening here ain't happening anymore, um, let's go him some R&R &R at the whorehouse. Let's have him go to the Willow World and get him a little piece. Have him, have him have some fun, get some steam off. That's my my generosity to my new commander. Uh, and um, in case he likes to talk while he's pillowing, you should be there too to interpret everything. Ouch. Oh, that is that is a gut punch. Um, Tornaga knows very well what he's doing. And Mariko kind of knows that he knows what he's doing. 
And she says, he, he, she knows that I have to go through this and Blackthorn has to go through this because they should never have actually done what they did, um, especially while she is married. And so this is a punishment without actually saying it. It's a punishment for all, everybody in this party. She gets to go isolate. And while he's isolating, Buntaro, while Buntaro is isolating, he's going to take care of this little piece of it too so that everybody sort of resets and gets back on an even playing field. Back at the council, Ishido has claimed that there has been an attempt at the life of the heir. So Chiba sort of put this in place where because of this, everybody sort of has to remain here in tight guards, in close quarters um, until a fifth member of council is, is, is chosen. And so they're kind of trapped, almost in a form of being hostages. They're trapped here. They can't move. They are watching theater shows that Ochiba is having put be put on. But until a fifth member is selected, there's no move. There's no movement happening here. That message about being sort of held hostage is sent back to the Portuguese who had up until this point been thinking about we need to side with Ishido and the council and not with Tornado. And now they're sort of like, well, hold on. Tornaga might be the one to actually have some reason, might be able to handle this a little bit better. Whatever they're doing seems to be done with a bit more hostility. And we can't, tr now that Lady Ochiba's there, we can't trust whatever the heck they're doing in there. And so back to what Blackthorn was sort of saying, like we should attack the Portuguese before they sort of make a decision. They sort of have a swing vote or a swing say in this. They haven't decided who they're going to back. It seems like up until this point, they were going to completely attack and turn on Tornaga. But now it's like maybe we need to hold up on that because... What the hell does Lady Oshiba do? She's essentially setting fires and keeping people sort of trapped until the council makes their move. Um, while these plays are being put on, uh, while everybody's being held hostage, we sort of see a flashback of Lady Oshiba's rise to power. Um, a lot like Mariko, she was not given choice. She was not made given onus, but she has made the best of her situation and used her power for her, for her personal gain. She was told by uh, the Lord's, Lord Tycho's wife at the time, who could not birth an heir, um, and many consorts and many people have come before her that they can't. And you seem to be able to a person who can do so. So if you can get this, you can get pregnant, please, let's do so. And apparently they torture her, they do a lot of, they drug her, they set her up, her body up, go through a lot of things for this, old, this man to lay on top of her, and eventually she does become pregnant. Since that, since she has become that, person to actually give the air. She has taken that ball um, that has sort of been forced upon her. The pain, the anguish that all came with that sort of been for forced upon her. She has taken that and now she made her her own thing. And now she holds more cards than most because she's the mother of the heir of this, this land. And so while she was probably visual, visually, what she was seeing was the lesser of the two between she and Mariko. Um, Mariko was ending up in a terrible, a, a worse off situation where her situation has wound up being the better for her overall. After that little flashback, we see that she is pushing for Lord Ito to be the fifth member of the council. And uh, she is double down, double downing on her desire to kill Tornaga. Under any circumstances, she wants that man dead. Back with Tornago and his, um, his team that he is having conversation with about what to do next, they're all sort of saying, um, we need to make a move. Our allies, the few allies that we have out there, are being asked to and become foes. We need to make a decision now before we won't even have a chance to reach out to them. Something needs to happen. We need to end this now. They all invoke the, the, the term Crimson Sky. We need to un unleash Crimson Sky, which is a they attack and attempt to basically kill all the other folks on the council. All of them. All of them die. And thus making Tornaga the one remaining council member uh, in the Shogun. Like that's where, how he becomes a Shogun. It's basically then he controls and, and takes all power. He, Tornaga, has zero desire to be a Shogun. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want to do it that way and gas his, his people, his team, come up with another way. Think of any other way, but come up with another way. I can't. I, that is not a, a way that I want to go about this. Um, and what is the first of several scenes of just, just pain and anguish for Mariko, she has to, uh, negotiate the terms, um, to obtain Kiko, who is the, the, she's really good at what she does as a whore. Um, <laughs> she's about that life. Um, she's in a relationship that looks like more than just sexual favors with Ami, 
Um, but her main job, what she is good at, um, is to being the top price, the high quality. She's the one that everybody asks for and wants. And so Mariko has to go to the, um, to the Willow, basically head lady and have a conversation and they just go tit for tat to the point where you can see that she realizes in there that, and I think the word has sort of gotten out how close she is. She's like, you never leave your interpreter side. And, and so she's kind of just twisting that knife to know that, like, I think you, you have a thing for him. And whether or not you slept with him is irrelevant to the fact that you care and want him. And so now you got to come here. Your Lord has told you you need to come here and, and, and do this deed. And so I'm going to I'm going to get the money out of you because no matter what, this has to happen. And you can't go back to your boss and tell him that you didn't make this deal. So. Um, let's uh, let's bargain and they go back and forth for a while to the point where she does eventually get the deal set to get Kiko. We see a shot of Kiko having to sort of break that news to Ami. Ami's kind of like, well, why does the barbarian keep getting everything? Why does Lord Tornado to keep giving him gifts? Um, and now it's even more because you're taking something from him and giving that to this guy. And I, it's going to be interesting to see how he responds to Kiko after he's she's been with Blackthorn. Like, I don't, he doesn't seem like the type of person who's going to take well to that um, for whatever male insecurities he may have, knowing that he's dating a, a whore. That's going to come back to bite him after the deed is done. So it's a wild scene that sort of exists between Mariko, Kiko, and Blackthorn, where they all sort of have to have a conversation and kind of get this ball rolling to get this night going. Um, before Kiko sort of comes in, Blackthorn and Mariko have a combo, and they're kind of just like, this, this we got to do this. Like, why do I feel like our eyes, like eyes are watching us? And she's like, well, it's, they are everyone is seeing this. Everybody wants to see this because they know that this has to happen for me to be with Black, for me to be with Quintaro, for you to be the, 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 the general without us laying together. I've made a mistake. I, we, I put us in this. We have to end this. Um, even though I, they both are like, you are who I want to be. Like you, I have a thing for you. You have a thing for me, but we have to put on the charade in front of everybody who's watching to sort of Take the stench off of us so that this isn't a thing. So Kiko comes and sort of plays into it more too. And um, she has to start translating some freaky, some freaky stuff from Kiko to, to Mariko. And then there's a, it's a heartbreaking scene. There's a sequence where in the eye line of Blackthorn, um, Mariko is direct and center. And Kiko gets behind her. Um, and forces Mariko to have to translate things to Blackthorn that are just very steamy and get Blackthorn looking at Mariko in even more ways. He can't see Kiko, but he's imagining all the freaky things that she's saying to, to her. Um, and it's essentially going to be, it's setting up that whatever night he has with Kiko, he is going to be imagining and thinking of Mariko, but he can't actually be with her which might even be worse for Mariko because she just had to translate all of these things to him knowing that they both want to be with each other and they can't. They are forced to sort of separate at this moment. And um, it's at that point that Kiko gets up and says, tell, tell him the bed's ready and I'm wait waiting for him. And she goes off and there's just a just heartbreaking moment. Um, Mariko leaves, but as she's leaving, Blackthorn sort of brushes brushes the tip of her his hand across her hand. That's sort of his way to acknowledge, like I don't, I don't want to be doing this. I know we have to do this. I know this is what has to be done, and I, I don't want to be with you. Um, but it's just like, oh, you suckers get me with that love. That's done. This is actually requited love. They they, but forbidden love. Um, this forbidden love that can't quite happen. Um, and I just hope. Kill some people. Get some people off the board. We gotta. I, these two, ah, it's just painful. The next night after the deed is done, he is paraded out of the whorehouse uh, with with Kiko to both say, "This is who he was with. This is where he was. He's not with his interpreter. Was nowhere to be seen, and she's there waiting. And Mariko and is there waiting for to be seen. But you see people whispering. You see people thing. Um, get a little bit more twist of the knife of saying. Uh, that with Blackthorn thanks her for the services. Mariko has to repeat that back. She's like, enjoy the night. And she's like, yeah, come back to see me anytime. I'm, I'm here for you. Um, 
which is a dig more for Marie for Mariko. She doesn't really quite mean that, but she knows, hey, if I can dig into her, I'm gonna do it. But that term, that phrasing affects Ami, who's looking on, and you can see that he's hurt by all of this. And she has that quick moment where whatever massage that she's doing when she's the courtesan, the greatest the greatest one here, um, it sort of comes down there because she feels like she's sort of hurt the person that she does actually care about. Mariko returns to Tornaga to tell her that the deed is done and he was pleased and she's, he's like, cool. Um, and for him, that's the end of that. Cool, I don't have to worry about Bintaro being jealous of this. I don't have to worry about you banging back together. I have just ended whatever the hell was happening. We don't have to talk about this anymore. Let's move on to the next thing. Lady Ochiva, you knew her when uh, you grew up with her and you knew her when you were young. And Mariko was like, well, I knew her at a time where she was called Rory. And um, before any of this stuff sort of has occurred, before the quest for power has occurred, I knew her then. And Toronaga's like, well, what changed? Like, why are you guys different? What changed her? And she just straight up says, fate changed her. Like, fate did that. Toronaga's like, well, look, everybody has hardships. Everybody has something that has occurred in their life. Nothing. This isn't so different. Uh, and they always handle their life in war with honor. And Mariko sort of giggles a little bit. and is like, look, pardon me, like with all due respect, that's BS. Women are not afforded the luxury to do things with honor of choosing why they go to war. Um, they just are at war. Like they didn't choose pride. They didn't, they didn't go in for pride or, or, or uh, power or money or re respect. They are just put into these situations and they have to sort of fight their ways out of it. At that point, the Toronaga kind of laughs and like, well, your, your father marveled at you and really wanted you to be a boy. Like she wanted nothing more to be a boy. And she's like, well, if he was so proud of me, he wanted me to be so good. Why did he betroth me to this peasant of a person? Like this person is irrelevant, doesn't do anything for our family, doesn't do anything for our alliances. And so that point, the Tor Toronaga is like, you don't know? Like, you really don't know? Uh, your father sent you there to get you a far, as far as possible away from what it is that he was about to do. And so that you were so far away and removed from it that you could extract revenge when you felt the time was coming. Um, and it's at that point that she says, oh, oh crap, I have I failed him. To which Toronaga says, no, your war your war is not over. Um, I think this is a twofold piece. One, he's ended that mess that occurred with she and Blackthorn, but now she's like, cool, now that you got that bug out of you, let me sort of change your trajectory and change your path so that you can be a little bit more focused and just be an interpreter, but then get that fired to get revenge on where what it is you're truly supposed to be. Um, and she is one of the better warriors there, and I, it's like, I, I want to put you towards that. If you're lovey and dovey and soft, it might not be the badass that I need you to be. Back at the council, the law, the vote for the fifth person is starting to happen. Um, they've spent enough time hostage, being hostages and uh, they're actually going to have this vote. And so Ishido's already on board. So that's one. But remember, everybody has to sort of put up, be a vote um, to get this one member and they all have to be in alliance. Um, two of them say without a heartbeat, like, yeah, cool, he's in. Uh, Sugiyama, which sort of made his, he had been making bones about this throughout this episode about how like, I don't like the way she's doing this. She's basically holding us hostages. We don't have a choice. Like, why are we trusting Lady Ochiba? Um, she, he comes in and says, nah, I'm not voting. I'm not doing this. Until these hostages are released, uh, I am not, I'm not making this decision to put this person up. Um, I feel like the quote unquote, there was an attempt on the heir's life as a bunch of BS to just make this move and make this happen. And I'm, I'm not really going to be a part of that. And Judah's kind of like, hostages? Like, who's talking about hostages? Like, that term has not been used. It is what they are, but that term has not been used. Um, but it has been now, and it's on sort of public record. We didn't see Ishido uh, sort of in his quarters thinking of what to do next. He's been outmaneuvered again. Um, it's at that point that Lady Ochiba comes in and says, okay, here's the deal. We need to speed this up. Like, I want Toronaga dead. I want him dead immediately. So whatever we have to do, let's make this process. And she was like, you really have a thing out for him. Why? So at that point that she says, um, I watch everything. I saw him. I saw him all those days whispering, making moves, making deals. I don't trust him. 
She's like, Akishi Jinsai may have been the person to actually kill my, uh, kill my father, but Toronaga is the one who sort of put all this into place. Like, he's the one who put these, 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 he's the puppet master. He's a string player behind all of this. Um, and his secret heart is no secret to me. Like, she genuinely feels that he's responsible for all this. And she was like, well, if that's the case, let's scream this from the rooftops. Like, let's, let's let everybody know about this. If we do so, his end's going to come in a heartbeat. Like, we don't have to worry about that at all. And it's at that point, she's like, well, what's the point? You can't stop him. Like, if we go the public opinion way, there, you clearly aren't doing things correctly to actually make this move happen. We need to go ahead and get the rights to just say we're going to go murder this man. And she said, I took fate into my own hands. And by compelling fate, I looked her straight in the eyes. And I looked at, looked at me and I scratched his eyes out. That's what I did with fate. Like I was a fighter. Like they pushed me against a wall. I took what they gave me and then I came out clawing. Um, and that's how I got to where I'm at. Uh, it's at that point that we see Sugi trying to escape Osaka. And in that, Ishido meets him, tells him, asks him one more time, like, hey, we need your vote. He's like, nah, I'm not doing that. And then all of a sudden, we see a shot of his entire crew uh, murdered. Said to be raiders, but we know. Um, that message gets back to Tornaga, who um, says, okay, they, they tried to put in a fifth member. They have subsequently then killed the person who was blocking that fifth member. Now that they have three, they're going to vote that one in. And then whoever they put in ever is going to vote that person. in. So we're quickly going to get back to five in a heartbeat. This is now rapidly going. And uh, the click ticking clock that's on my head is happening even faster. So I know at the beginning of this, I said no Crimson Sky, but F it. All bets are off. Bring on the Crimson Sky. And that's how this episode ends. Really fitting episode, a really good episode, a strong, basically to give us an impetus of getting to Crimson Sky um, and, and saying that there were reservations to what it is it sort of entails. But the biggest piece is to seeing the, the beginning of Lady Ochiba, Rory, and Mariko, what they become, what life sort of put upon them, where they wound up, and how they have gone about life since that point. Ochiba's very been much like the they put a tiger in a cage but didn't, didn't declaw it. And she was backed into a wall. She she did what she was supposed to do. We did with it, and then took all the power that sort of came with that. The flip side of that, Mariko um, was put into a situation where she was not the power person of it all. Even though she has power, she was a per a great soldier. She was a great warrior. She's the mind of one of the greatest warriors and and people up there. But she has sort of been living in this ice, this coldness, and she has not allowed herself to be happy, sad, or revengeful. And all because she sort of thought her father threw her away with this, with this trash. Um, seeing how those stories are and then seeing the heartbreak that uh, just happened multiple times in this episode with her. Some of the, again, some of the best performances that I've seen, I can actually possibly think of is just seeing her <sighs> stutter or become choked up with having to deliver the words that Kiko was putting to true black thorn through her um seeing the kind of hesitation and the realization that toranaga knows and that shut is basically giving her the shut it down order what i'm giving you is not to really not to really punish you but it's to pop you on the hand and say i know what happened and i i don't particularly care but there are a lot of things that i don't want that to affect so i need you to get that out um and uh the moment where she realized, like, oh, we have to put on this whole charade. Otherwise, this is going to get ugly fast. Lady Ochiba is far worse than Ishio. And uh, it is going to be fascinating to see what machination she continues to do to get the regions to basically be do her bidding. And if she can get there fast enough before uh, Toranaga and them come a knocking. What did you guys think about this episode, uh, this heartbreaking episode of Shogun, episode six? Leave your thoughts and comments in the comments below. If you haven't already, you can follow us on Twitter at Hollywood ADI. You can hit us up on email at HollywoodAlreadyDigit at gmail.com. We also have a podcast with the same name. That's on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, any other place podcasts. We're there. And like always, I got my ticket. You got yours.